Welcome to Understanding Russia, a student-led podcast from Belgorod State University. I'm your host, Ian, and along with the staff and students at Belgorod State University, I have taken it on myself to try to explain the Russian attitude to hosting and being the perfect guest. It seems that celebrations are an art form here. When it comes to dining, I'm a stickler for manners. It is serious business and many things bother me when food is served. I consider it the height of disrespect to slurp your soup, reach across other diners and eat only with a fork where a knife is necessary. When someone attempts to cut their meat with the edge of a fork or worse, impale it and eat it like a meat lollipop, it stirs homicidal tendencies within me. I find it hard to explain, especially as when someone insults me directly, I usually find it funny. When someone eats with their mouth open, it haunts my dreams and shapes my opinion about them in a way that simply isn't rational. My experience of social eating in Russia has revealed a tapestry of habits that I found a little surprising considering the homogeneity of Soviet culture. Indeed, it runs the gamut. Naively, I feel that street food can be consumed in the street, but when I think about it, I usually cut a lonely figure throwing crumbs for the pigeons while seated on the park bench, feasting on the most delicious pastries I've ever tasted, and sipping exotic coffee made in a chrome-plated imported Italian machine by a dab-handed student earning their keep. Russian kebabs are called shavirma and often contain fries and mayonnaise. I ate one once, but the fear of an instant cardiac arrest keeps me from trying it a second time. When inviting guests to our humble abode, my wife and I always end up mixing our traditions. My concession to local custom involves allowing an overflowing plate of fresh vegetables to take center stage no matter the occasion, and her concession is to allow me to apportion food directly from the stove to the plate. There are quaint customs here that I like. If there is a man at the table, he has a duty to keep the glasses top up, and when the bottle is empty, it is not allowed to remain on the table. One thing I don't find quaint is the propensity for interminable toasts. Every five minutes, someone will inevitably call on some unfortunate or worse eager diner to make a toast. At this moment, I always glance at the person who knows this toast maker best. If they are sitting looking at their glass in mild despair, contemplating the rapid cooling of their food, then I know we're in for an anecdote of a length that would make Homer blush. Often, these toasts are long and very amusing. Occasionally, they are rambling and worthy and sleep-inducing, lethal on a hot day when your senses are dulled by alcohol. Mine are always brief and British and largely underwhelming to my audience for whom toasting is a cultural art form. I am as yet incompetent in this area. Russians generally eat fresh and healthy food from small plates, a dream scenario for any dietitian. I have never eaten this well, but I do find etiquette around holidays baffling, particularly around birthdays. The days chosen for national holidays are fairly predictable, but each one has its own traditions I still can't acclimatize to. One more revealing fact for you. I have traveled widely, but I've never lived in a place where there is a 24-hour florist. Yes, you heard me. I live near a 24-hour florist. Russians see nothing odd in this. Apparently, the need for flowers at three in the morning is obvious enough not to warrant discussion. I wish someone would explain this. Ivan, an admitted black hole where etiquette is concerned, joined me for a chat on customs and traditions surrounding food. You're listening to Understanding Russia. So there's a strange custom in Russia, and I I must admit that I do not want, I do not like to uh, celebrate my birthday. So I managed to get married on my birthday, so that I would never have to host anybody and celebrate my birthday by giving other people things. I don't understand this. Well. First of all, it's a very cunning way to always remember the anniversary of your marriage. Thank you. And secondly, what's so weird about it? I well, in the West, we generally it, on my birthday I do nothing. I'm I'm treated like a prince, a lord of the manor, and other people come and they worship me and they give me food and bake me cakes and give me presents and gifts. Well, in my dreams, um, actually, most of them, most of the time, my on my birthday was spent working and trying to ignore it. Um, it's another day in the year for me. But uh, here in Russia, it's a big deal. I, I go into the department and there are cakes and plastic cups full of cheap champagne and people make a big fuss and I walk in I what is it someone's birthday yes have a cake and if you don't have a piece of cake then it's like an insult is this do you feel this at all well to some extent i guess yeah because birthday is it's a day when you provide for other people in order for them to be happy for you so because otherwise what's the, why should they be happy that you're one year older so you celebrate it with other people by treating them to something like cakes and other food 
And well, you don't give them presents, they give presents to you. But you must be, let's say, you must be a host of this celebration. You must host it, not other people host it for you. But most of the time you don't bake cake for yourself. Other people bake it for you. That's the only difference. Is that true? Well, yeah, at least in our family, my father is an exceptional cook. So it doesn't matter whose birthday it is. He always bakes a cake, except when it's his birthday, because my sister usually bakes it then. So that's a little convention that you have. In Russian culture, there's also a thing about uh, being the perfect host, right? And and being the perfect guest. There's like There's a whole way of visiting people and there's a whole way of receiving people in the house. Does this vary according to where you are or is it the same everywhere? I honestly wouldn't know because I haven't visited that many, let's say, different parts of even Russia to know if there is a difference between where I'm from and here. It's mostly the same. The only difference is that here you can come to someone's party when they're more or less still preparing for it. Almost everything is done, but some things are still being brought to the table. Like so we, some toss, we toss a salad together, that sort of idea. Yeah? Well, no, you're usually not allowed to help because you're here to be treated to something. So you're not allowed to help. In my household, it's usually everyone comes when everything has been set like 15 or 20 minutes. Because for my father, at least, it's embarrassing when people come and they're not awed. They're not in awe of from, the spread. Yeah. Yes, from the whole, let's say, cornucopia of different foods he has prepared. Because he's a terrific cook, so he likes to show off sometimes. Why not? The, this is another thing, a Polny stole, right? This is the idea that you have a full table and it's laden down with with uh, greens and fruits and all sorts of lovely goodies like cakes and sweets and there's a bottle of vodka on the table. I mean, this is a stereotype of the traditional peasant's welcome. Is this a stereotype or does it, is it really true? I wouldn't say that. It's a stereotype. It's more or less true. And if we're talking about peasants, well, I'm obviously one. Yes. And in our, in my experience at least, it is, it's better than it's just the table which is full full of goods. Some You must cook so much that not everything fits on the table. Right. There should be like additional, let's say, bedside table or <laughs> chest of drawers on top of which you put things which just didn't fit on the table because there is so much of the things. And bottles of alcohol are usually kept under the table so they wouldn't get spilled accidentally when someone is reaching for someone. So there's, there's not enough room even for the alcohol? Oh no, alcohol is there, but it's kept usually somewhere from, not beyond arm's reach, but not in a way, because people will be usually reaching for something or asking for something to get uh, passed to them. So not to spill it accidentally, not to hit it, because they're usually tall bottles, aren't they? Well, yes. So, yeah, it's usually, I think it's done more out of practicality than out of um, cultural thing. So if you if you come into a room and you only see a bottle of vodka on the table with some what do we what do we have with vodka pickles pickles pickled cucumbers then a salty fish oh no it's salted yeah. fish salted yeah salted fish. fish not salty salty fish it's angry fish <laughs> so, sal <laughs> <laughs> salted fish um and bread it's like the holy trinity of foods you always can eat with vodka yeah so i i've been to a couple of vodka parties the, the pro the idea is that you go around to someone's house and if it's just mail company there's a bottle on the table and some snacks that you can then eat so what's the process right so if you if you have this vodka what how do you drink the vodka and what do you do well it also, once again, it depends who you visit, because when someone comes to me, well, it's because of my father and where I was um, brought up. I cannot allow just there to be snacks. It should be busting at least somewhat with foods. So when it comes to just drinking vodka, usually it's because something happened or people need to talk to someone, like very intimately talk to their friend or their relative about something very personal. And vodka, as we know, all alcohol helps people to get courage. Like It's liquid courage. Liquid yes. courage. Yeah. Yes. So when it's drunk, you you take shots. We never mix. We Sometimes we don't even drink after something sweet to, let's say, kill the initial... Shock of the alcohol. Flavor. Oh, flavor, <laughs> right. It's not about shock, it's about flavor. And sometimes you don't even eat something. You only like 
sniff it like <laughs> a piece of bread. It's a very, very old Russian thing. You uh, take a shot and you sniff a piece of bread, if it's a first at least shot. And then you eat a pickle or not? You can eat, uh, usually when it's first, you don't it's, eat anything because in, if there is a Russian pro- proverb between the first and second, there is little time. I, I don't know. How, <laughs> I, I, I really don't know how to properly translate it, but this suggests that be- between first and second shots, that's, that's almost ni- no time passes. There's no time. You're listening to Understanding Russia. Well, it, when I first came to Russia, I was invited to a couple of these uh, get to know you sessions with just men. And I was a fencer and my fencing coaches didn't require any money from me for the coaching sessions. And instead they said, could you build, bring some vodka and some meat? Yeah, this ubiquitous meat that I didn't understand what that was. But I bought some anyway and some nice fresh bread. And we basically sat there with, there were four of us and three bottles of vodka. And this for a young man was exciting, uh, but they did drink vodka very rapidly and uh, I tried to keep up with them and I was very drunk but the following day I didn't have a hangover which was startling to me uh, it's very pure stuff isn't it so this this tradition goes back a long way do you think I wouldn't know but I think so because I have heard stories and I read in books that even it, w- when it was military time people were fighting Russians always still had a bottle of vodka with them either to celebrate or to grieve or to think or to do something to throw at a tank. What it? Wa- wasting such precious thing. <laughs> you're, you're obviously not Russian. Well, th- this is obvious. Yeah, this is definitely obvious. Only because of that. Otherwise, I would. Uh, yeah, wasting the vodka. A bit. I don't know. There are some spirits I'd rather put in my car than in my body. But especially here, I, I, what you call cognac, I I don't understand. But um. Well, as a Russian, I can tell you that vodka is the superior spirit to any other thing. Well, aside from absinthe, of course. <laughs> And you have personal experience. Oh, right, no. enough said. Oh, enough oh said. no, we don't have the fifth. I cannot plead the fifth. <laughs> okay, let's go back to this whole, like, hosting thing. My wife, we have a different culture in our family. My wife is very Russian, and she wants this polny stall, this full table. And we've come to a compromise, because I'm the chef, and I like to cook a dish. So we'll have fish, and we'll have some rice, or maybe, and then we'll have some vegetables along with it. And I do my European thing, where I cook a steak, or a salmon steak, or whatever it happens to be. And then... She she always insists on chopping vegetables so that the table has at least some vegetables on it. And I've noticed that my Russian friends, they mix everything together, right? So in my tradition, you have your main meal and then you have a dessert or then you have a cheese board. There's, there's always a set number of dishes that you'll have. But in Russia, I saw my friend and she was eating a cake and then she picked up a piece of cucumber and ate that too. And I don't know, there was something about that that outraged me. <laughs> You're not allowed to do that kind of thing. I, I was I was staring at her for quite a while. She thought she'd done something wrong, but uh, she hadn't really. I mean, so she was mixing and and dill and parsley, and just she started munching on a piece of dill in the middle of the coffee break. This is strange behaviour to me. Is this normal? First of all, I would like to uh, do, I would like to ask you a question as well. All right. You were outraged because she was eating out of order, or because she was mixing unmixable flavours? Both. Well, if it's a second thing, I agree with you. But if it's a first thing, then how snobbish are you? I, I have standards. What do you mean you have standards? You should eat only things which are allowed. What at, does it mean? At the right time. What is the right time to eat things? Well, you don't eat. You don't start eating sweet things when you're eating savory things. You have to save the sweet till afterwards. Well, you shouldn't eat sweet things at all because most of them are very bad for you for your health, right? That's the fun. Well, yeah. So there is. Also, some fun in eating savory and sweet things together. But if you if you bake a cake like your father does, right? When do you eat the cake? Do you eat the cake at the beginning of the birthday meal or at the end of the birthday meal? Usually, it is at the middle because if it is the end of the birthday, because people most likely will be tipsy and full because. There, there is a cornucopia of foods and it is very sad to see a cake being half or quarter eaten. But people cannot help it because they were eating the whole evening a lot of different foods. So it's somewhere near the middle of the whole celebration. So people still can celebrate and be treated to this cake. 
Well, that makes some sort of sense. But another thing that outraged me was I served some nice oily fish on a plate and then they started using it for other things like fruit and cake and all that. And I was taking their plates away so that they could use a side plate like like civilized people. And they thought that was very odd too. Why do you use the same plate for everything? What's the difference? Well, this the, the flavors of the, the fish will contaminate the cake. Well, not really. Why would it contaminate the cake? You you are not spilling oil from the fish. If there is oil from the fish, most people would take a piece of bread and let's say scoop it. And mop it up. Yeah, mop it up and eat it because it's tasty. Sure. Because oil is tasty. Okay, look, but there's always traces. If you have mustard on your plate, right, and then you have a cake, you don't want mustard in your cake. What's the point of cooking a cake and then like having traces of mustard on it? You are not leaving traces, Ian. If you're leaving traces, you're a bad eater. In some cultures, I know, you meant to leave something at the side of the plate to show that you've finished. In Arab culture, I believe that's true. Not an expert on that. But in Russia, your plate has a sort of function of stopping things spilling all over the place. Are you supposed to leave your plate empty? Yes, because it shows that you have enjoyed the meal very much, that you have cleaned the whole plate. Right. It comes especially when it's older people. They will give you a hearty meal and they want you to eat up. If you will leave something, they will think that you You either dislike it, even if you say, oh, I'm sorry, I'm full, I have eaten today, I cannot... They will, they will think that you dislike what they have given you. But if you have a whole table full of food... Oh, no, in that case, there must be leftovers. Not must be, but there will be leftovers, and no one will be surprised. It, it will be surprising if something will be untouched. Ah. That will be the surprising part. Fair enough. When we have holidays here in Russia, we have when we have holidays, we uh, we invite people over. Who do you invite to your? Let's say, well, there are different traditions, right? So a New Year, you in, it's a family thing, right? It's not a, it's not like it's it's a bit more like Christmas is in the West, maybe, or Chinese New Year if, in China, I presume. The the Father's Day, or what what do we have here? Oh, the 23rd of February. I mean. Yes. The Man's Day. Or Defender's Day. Well, it used to be Armed Forces Day, but then it was later turned into Man's Day because we have Women's Day and we never had... We don't even celebrate Father's Day here. It's it's, <laughs> so, it's, it's not a thing. Is, is, that, is that a statement on Russian culture? Well, no. It's more of a th what we consider holidays. We have New Year's. We have uh, 23rd uh, 3rd of February. We have 8th of March, International Women's Day. Then we have 1st of May, which is a leftover from USSR culture, the day of the walker, let's call it. Uh, the 9th of May, the day of the victory, it's a celebration of the anniversary of the end of Second World War. And then there is a big gap. There aren't really like prolific summer holidays. There are some and some are celebrated, some, some are even revered, but they're not that prolific. You're listening to Understanding Russia. So there's a big gap between that and New Year. Well, there is 1st of September. So what's that? It's the first day of school. And that's so a big deal, isn't it? It's a big deal for parents because <laughs> they get rid of their children finally. Fantastic. Uh, and then, let me think, is there anything? Oh, yeah, there's Mother's Day. Mother's Day? Yes, in autumn. In autumn. And then, yeah, I guess New Year and uh, Orthodox Christmas. So, do each of these celebrations have a different thing going on? Some of them do. Like 23rd of February and 8th of March, obviously we see who is the target of celebration. So who you not pay your respects to, it sounds too <laughs> grim. <laughs> who you celebrate? You celebrate how beautiful are women, how much we love them. You will celebrate our mothers, great uh, grandmothers, great grandmothers, sisters, and just our loved ones, etc, etc. Well, this is, I think this happens in most places that women's, well, Women's Day is peculiar to to old socialist countries, I think. That's the biggest celebration. In, in the West, it's much more political. It's it's about political campaigning. But this idea that you have a sort of Day of Defenders or Man's Day, how do you celebrate that? The same way we'd celebrate Women's Day. It's just that... What, do you give flowers to men? No, you give men presents <laughs> like socks, socks, shaving cream, razor, the manly thing, you know? So the manly man thing. <laughs> manly presents. Well, not New manly. oil for your car. I wouldn't say, yeah, sometimes even that. I wouldn't say manly, I would say very, very useful or mundane, which you use every day. Because 
th- there isn't a single person, or at least man on earth, who would say, oh no, I don't need another pair of socks. There is no such thing as too many socks. This is true. You need socks always. So annually you get a, a sock change and an oil change in your car. <laughs> yes, all, only once a year. <laughs> once a year. So uh, that's, that's, that's gift giving for men. And, and for women, I've noticed... Uh, a, Every 8th of March is it's crazy flower time. Oh, flowers are mandatory that day, but don't think that you don't give gifts. Of course you get you give perfume if you you love. Women's Day is more nebulous because you just give something that your precious woman likes. But to all other women, you just give flowers as a token of of appreci- appreciation. I I um I made a faux pas about flowers uh, this year and I was told off by my wife. Uh How many flowers should you give to someone? You always must give an odd number of flowers. So one, three, five for people who don't know what odd is. <laughs> Because uh, even number of flowers is reserved for grieving. It's usually given to the dead. It's put on their grave. Ah. Yeah, it's more sign of their death. So of grief, of bereavement. Mm-hmm. Et cetera, et cetera. When it's an odd number, it's just flowers, it's just a gift. But I believe at some point it doesn't matter. If you give 44 flowers to someone, it doesn't matter because no one will be counting it. So up some number, it doesn't matter. But if you give two flowers to someone, that's an obvious <laughs> sign that I hope you die or something like this. I heard that in Germany, if you toast somebody with water, it means you want them to die. I don't know if it's true. Really? It'd be very nice if it was, but uh, I think in the old days, if you toasted someone with water, it means death to you and yours. If you give someone two flowers, is that the end of a relationship? Well, it depends whether you gave two flowers to them intentionally or unintentionally, or you, or if it was a joke. The last two flowers in the shop. Yeah, something like this, but most people would throw away one flower or divide it and give one flower to someone else. Oh, I see. Because it, it really is a very bad thing when you give, like, four flowers is not that bad, six is not that But if you give two flowers to someone, that's, I think, is, like, the grimmest thing you can give to someone. How many times have you given flowers in the past year, then? Oh, my God. Why didn't you ask me something easier? Um... Does that mean a lot? Yeah, of course. Oh, right. Well, I thought you wouldn't give any flowers at all to people. Why would you think so? Because you're an uncultivated peasant. No, I give flowers because I'm a peasant. I cultivate flowers <laughs> and I give them. <laughs> well, okay, fine. And that's actually true, yes. I expect it is true, actually. Oh, yeah, being late. I've noticed here in Russia a lot of people are late. Really? Yeah. Five minutes doesn't seem to matter at all. And people are never early by five minutes. They're usually late by five minutes. I have never noticed, honestly. Well, that's because you're Russian. No, because I arrive 30 minutes earlier or 20 minutes earlier. I hate being late. I would I would much rather wait for someone than someone else to wait for me because it's impolite to be late. Yeah, I think it disrespect. if you disrespect somebody's time, you disrespect them, right? Yes, I would think so. So is this a culture, well, apart from present company accepted, is this a Russian thing that you've, you say you've never noticed it? Ian, you also must understand that you're saying, is this a Russian thing? thing I, i don't know what does it mean is this a russian thing i'm just a person i just i don't think it's unusual i never saw anyone else say that oh you must be late because it's a russian thing or oh you mustn't be late well i have heard you mustn't be late you must be on time but i've never heard anyone say you must be earlier or you must be late so i don't think it's russian or, or not russian thing I, th- i think it's a thing of a, of every other person so it's their very own thing Are you, te- are you telling me that you don't speak for the Russian people? <laughs> Surprising, isn't it? <laughs> so you're never late? No, sometimes I am because of the circumstance. But I hate being late, so I try not to. Hmm. Of course, it would be foolish for me to say that I'm never late. Because sometimes the bus is late. Um, you're, I... not, you're not late because you want to be late. Oh, you're, no, you're just never. Late. You're late because... Of Never. circumstances. Even if it is someone I hate, I I cannot allow myself to be late because it's simply the way I am. I am. I hate when other people wait for me. I'm fine with waiting for others. I hate when others wait for me. So you're secretly a nice person. No, I'm just a person who likes to get straight into the work. So when someone comes, I can say, all right, I have been waiting for you, so let's get to work. But I usually tell it when someone else is late and... Even though I was sometimes tempted to say, 
oh, you are so late. I have been waiting for half an hour, even though I was half an hour earlier and they were on time, but I never did it. But I was tempted to. So do you consider yourself a polite person? No. How would you define politeness? Politeness is when you do your best not to offend someone and make someone feel uh, welcome. So you you make no effort to make people feel welcome or respected in that way? No, I'm not being rude, but I'm not polite, I think. Because politeness is something which needs to be studied or taught to someone because it's not easy being polite especially when you look or if you listen to people who are properly uh, let's say informed on that they will tell you there are so many rules to being polite so you need to study being polite so you think it's a form is... a form of behavior right it's a form of behavior that you're not going to conform to i don't think it's a form of, of behavior i think it's an art of behavior and you feel that that's just a step too far for you i'm just not, I think, smart enough or I just can be bothered. But I'm not rude, once again. I'm something in between. I'm not going out of my way to offend everyone and make them uncomfortable. But I'm also not going out of my way to make them feel as happy as they can. You're listening to Understanding Russia. In this conclusion to the interview from part one of this two-part series on etiquette, Dmitry, our interviewer, turned his thoughts to food, as is his wont. Daria Kosova, an expert on all things etiquette, started with some advice for the ill-mannered. In particular, she started, in particular, she had some advice for what to do when you sit down at the table. This question requires a very extensive answer. I would recommend using the elbow rule, that we draw our elbows in, or at least bring them close to the torso, and do not stick them like, like bony weapons. I'd also recommend sitting with a straight back in any case. It's very important for our health. You know, when we're hunched over and cross our legs, our whole body is twisted, squeezed, and probably the food is not quite as easily digested. I would definitely ban everyone from using their smartphones while eating. And of course, it's not only about being polite or impolite, but also about safety. There's an awesome Russian cartoon, which is very popular in Japan. And there's a moment when a character talks on a smartphone while eating and gets into a very unpleasant situation. This is how children see it, and children imitate us. It seems that, in addition to cutlery, a smartphone at the table is almost a permanent presence. Did the character choke on something in the scene? Yes, he wasn't having a good time of it. I was brought up on this cartoon, but I do not recall this episode, unfortunately. Those cartoons are amazing. They have a show called Etiquette, which is just about how to use a smartphone. At the table will put away the smartphone, and of course it doesn't belong on the table. It can get dirty, it can get damaged, we'll be nervous because we'll think that someone texted us. If there's any alerts or pop-up messages, we'll become distracted. I'd also recommend that a well-mannered person should use a napkin while having his or her meal, a textile napkin. Unfortunately, it's not common everywhere, not in every household, and I also use them on special occasions. I don't have time to keep washing the table linen. Napkins aren't only for keeping us looking clean, they also put us in the mood to dine. Tableware and linens create a certain atmosphere. We respect those having dinner with us. We pay attention to what we eat, how we serve it, and how we set the table in general. And the whole thing has some magic to it, because all the people, well, we have a host or a hostess who welcomes the guests, but even if it's just a family, they play a role in the meal and talk to each other more politely. They'll say, pass me the salt, please, and you will, and not just the salt. Here, not everywhere, but mostly, you'll only ever have a salt shaker. I've read in some European sources that you are supposed to pass condiments together, not individually. This is because someone might prefer to add some pepper, but will only ask for the salt. But I can't remember exactly where I read about this custom. Which very British logic, you know, asking for one thing and actually wanting another. Well, a typical scene then, after dinner, there is a lot of washing up to do. Everyone takes their dishes to the sink. Who has to wash them? Oh, Dmitry, you went straight to the role of the guests. That's the difference between our culture and Western culture. We have a word ichni, meaning their problem, which is something both you and I, I'm sure, are trying to eradicate from general speech. But here's the fact. In our culture, the hostess tends to expect assistance, and this is very common. She's willing to have help from the others. And this causes puzzlement among Europeans, and by the way, among Asians too. If you offer a Chinese woman help, if you start to clean up her kitchen or somehow intervene, Intervene in her system, she'll be astonished. We have a more liberal view, that is, close friends help us clear the table. If the event was major, then all the guests, as you said, can clear plates from the table. We have such a custom. As for who washes up, I would suggest, of course, using a dishwasher instead of a person, especially a woman. 
That's from an advert. You're a woman, not a dishwasher. Exactly. About that, I think it's wrong to break the established order. First of all, it may embarrass the hostess because she may have developed her own washing sequence or maybe she's used to wiping the dishes dry. It's kind of an inner kitchen. So it's an interesting conundrum. We don't insist. We just offer help. We have a tradition of aggressive help when we clear the plates and take them to the kitchen. But my recommendation is to ask, may I help you? Or do you need me to help you clear the table? And then act according to the response. How are guests usually received in Russia? All the best for the guests. And this custom has existed for centuries, not just years. I've read some accounts of this where all the best food is served to guests, while the hosts themselves are half-starved and still somehow acquire the best products from somewhere and provide a feast. This is indeed our people's culture, and it's deep-rooted. But people who visit might have good or bad intentions, and you couldn't always tell whether they were good or bad. Researchers can only suggest what drove the host at that point. If the guest was an enemy, they needed to be appeased, and a decent meal would reassure them. Food is the first priority. Remember Maslow's hierarchy of needs? All you have to do is feed someone. On the other hand, people are hospitable by nature. They want to do their best, whether it's for their friends or foes. I think there isn't much difference in this between Russia and other countries. For example, there is a Scandinavian saying that goes something like Bow betide him who doesn't receive a guest well. But what is the right way to invite guests? We know that if it's just an informal meeting, you can simply call the person and say, come over. If it's a close friend, we may even not specify the date and time. But what if it's less informal? Firstly, I have to say something about this informality. Our informality is sometimes a dead end. You're told, come over someday. That isn't, of course, an invitation. For example, in a student dorm, when someone says, you must drop by sometime, and doesn't specify the date and time, they don't really mean it. They're just being polite. This can be considered a call to action. You should seek clarification when necessary. Should we discuss the date and time? Time. As for formality, formal invitations should, of course, be in writing. There should be a hard copy, not just printed out, it's only a part of it. Take vignettes, for example. They may even contain address, phone number, the information that is repeated in every invitation. If one is invited to a major event, then his first and last name should be written in by hand, as well as the signature and the kind regards part. The name of the receiving party's head must also be written in by hand. This is considered beautiful and worthy of the highest classes. And the calligraphic handwriting is also very important here. The invitation, of course, must include such words as you are invited and the information about where the person is invited to. The date, time and place must be clearly described. If the guest is traveling from afar, then the invitation should definitely include a QR code that shows the best route. And the dress code must also be indicated in the invitation. This rule is coming back, although many people say that its power was lost some time ago. And we certainly should follow the specified dress code. And pay attention to the note. There must be an RSVP. You're listening to Understanding Russia. Well, what if it's more informal event, like people visiting each other, friends or acquaintances? What is the list of, how does it go now, do's and don'ts on a visit? I think that being on time is of the first importance. And of course, before attending an event where there's supposed to be food or drinks, you should warn the hosts beforehand about your food allergy or individual nutritional needs. The third point is what you bring to the event. You must always bring something. It is customary to give a small gift or a souvenir if you've recently been to another country or traveled to another city. For instance, the city of Tula is famous for its gingerbread, which would be a lovely tea time compliment and a topic for small talk. Fruit or something alcoholic, maybe a box of sweets, a small compliment. By the way, in our culture, the hostess usually gives the food away to the guests. In European culture, the hostess doesn't have to share. In fact, things are changing in our country too. If a gift is valuable, the hostess may keep a gift for her family and not offer it to guests. I'm sorry, but it's generally accepted that if a bottle of wine is brought to the party, then it should be put on the table for guests. In our culture, it's meant to compliment the already set table. This seems to me more like a Soviet-era holdover. If we take Russia before the revolution, such gifts would never be shown to the guests. And the last point is if you are the guest, you must follow the rules of the host. You shouldn't insist on your own rules. Don't dictate who starts when, who sits where, who to wait or not to wait 
for. You're the guest. Just relax and have fun. What shouldn't the guest do? I think you shouldn't wander around the house. Don't poke around or peek into people's cupboards. Behave yourself, especially when there's no other guests and you're the only one at the moment. Try to be respectful. Come on time, not early. It's important not only not to be late, but also not to come too early, because the hosts may simply not have enough time to clean up the house, to smooth their ruffled feathers, and of course they'll feel uncomfortable doing this in front of you. And leaving you in a separate room may not always work. It depends on the size of the house or a flat, on the idea of the party, but it just come on time. Another thing that I'd recommend is if you bring flowers, bring them without packaging film and wrappers. Don't bring gifts in plastic bags, remove branded packaging. It's certainly not good to come late. If you are to be late, warn the hosts and tell them the approximate time when you'll arrive. You mustn't do it just four minutes before the event begins, but as soon as possible. As soon as you understand that you may be late, inform the hosts about it. Be a pleasant guest, discuss the weather, nature, hobbies, whatever. But don't be silent and don't look sad. If you're feeling down, if the weather has affected you, or you're simply not feeling well, it is better not to go in the first place. Make up an excuse. By the way, in our country, not, not feeling well is the perfect reason for you to use and not to rain on someone's parade. Never give tragic events, unpleasant stories, or anything that may spoil people's mood as a reason. Do not bring up topics that may cause conflict. There may be people in the room who support other parties, follow other religions, the principles of which you may dislike. Don't accuse anyone of anything. You are the guest, and you should behave accordingly. Speaking about tardiness, in short, does one simply need to be on time in Russia? We arrive on time out of respect for ourselves and the people we interact with. Of course, a few minutes past the appointed hour isn't considered late. It's clear that there may be traffic jams, you may not know the route well, or there might be a mix-up. But 15 minutes, that is certainly significant. I highly recommend warning or letting the host know about it somehow. On what occasions do people give gifts in Russia? Russia celebrates many holidays. Let's start with the New Year. The New Year starts from the 31st of December to the 1st of January. It is slightly more popular than Christmas. It's on this day that children receive gifts and friends and family exchange gifts. And gifts are often given before New Year's Eve, the reasons of which I don't really understand. But I've noticed that much fewer gifts and mementos are given after New Year's Eve. When people have spent the New Year's holidays somewhere, as often happens, they'll come back with souvenirs. But after the holidays end, we all tend to forget about making up for gifts ungiven. Before the New Year, work colleagues exchange gifts, give them to their bosses and close associates, they meet in a cafe or at home and exchange gifts. Depending on the budget, the gifts may diverge from small souvenirs to things that one have dreamed of. These are often cute little tokens, but rarely anything larger. And of course, birthdays are considered much more important than New Year. People very often give Lunar New Year symbols as gifts. Lunar New Year symbols are a recent import. Although Lunar New Year takes place around February, we incorporate this into our celebration with appropriate colors and symbology. The New Year in our country is celebrated about as widely as Christmas in Western countries. And we celebrate Christmas from the 6th to the 7th of January, unlike in the West. How is it celebrated and what gifts are customary? It seems to me that the way we treat this holiday is very complex. There are families who do not celebrate Orthodox holidays, but many have an awareness of it. The Church has regulations on both Christmas gifts and celebration. But again, for many people, it's just another reason to get together. The next holiday is the 14th of February, Valentine's Day. A complex subject. Very complicated and controversial. Well, it's a real holiday for some. For others, even mentioning it is forbidden. Many openly express their negative mindset and protest against the whole city as well as all the shops and cafes being covered with hearts and against the color red being everywhere. This holiday should not impose vanity or go over the line. The next holiday is the 23rd of February. Our country celebrates it as Men's Day. It used to be the Defender of the Fatherland Day. It's still called that. Its original name was Red Army Day, but then it became Defender of the Fatherland Day and eventually All Men's Day. And we do not have a separate Father's Day. I mean, there isn't a holiday which honors only fathers. That's saying a lot. And unfortunately, in our country, this is actually a cultural distortion. Every poem and every song is devoted to mothers, and it's believed that the mother is by default the most caring and reliable person. This explains the focus on the mother in our culture. I completely disagree and believe that the man is a full 
fully-fledged participant in the family and should be awarded the same respect. I've seen examples where fathers are much closer to their children and spend more time with them than mothers do. Therefore, the 23rd of February is our day to honor men, to show them how important they are and to demonstrate our attitude to them. Here, International Women's Day is associated with extreme feminism. And when did this holiday appear? In the early 20th century, people began to celebrate it after the revolution, and it didn't originate in our country. Where then? I can't tell you right now, but if I'm not mistaken, it came from the US. You're listening to Understanding Russia. All right, how's it celebrated? Just the same as the 23rd of February. The only thing is that songs are devoted to the beloved mothers. Children recite emotional poems and sing songs about the best mothers in the world. And grandmothers are also congratulated on this holiday. As it turns out, we don't really celebrate Mother's Day, but we incorporate it into International Women's Day on the 8th of March. Children make gifts by hand and give them to their mothers. The next holiday is Pascha, Orthodox Easter. We have a slightly different perception of this holiday compared to people in other countries. Almost everybody celebrates Easter just as spontaneously as Maslenitsa, Pancake Day. Even non-religious people and those who do not usually follow the church's rules. They go to church before Easter and stand throughout the midnight service. One can see, judging by the number of people in the church, that very many at this point come to worship God. It's a very special holiday. There's an amazing feeling of some kind of purity and glow. Even if you don't go to church, you'll still feel that everything is completely different on this day. September the 1st is Knowledge Day. Sending memes and greeting cards in all chats and messaging services is almost mandatory. Everyone congratulates each other on this holiday. On this day, first graders and graduates of the upcoming academic year are raised to honored status. They dress very elegantly and they literally shine like new. They're given the best bouquets and gifts. I'd say they are very fortunate. For other students, this is just a normal school day. But first, there will be an all-school assembly. All pupils come to school, and there will be a grand school assembly either indoors or outdoors. In the beginning, the head teacher addresses students and gives them an outline of the school rules. Students are grouped in their classes to listen. And then comes the festive program where they read poems. How many flowers should there be in a bunch? Are there any rules regarding that in our culture? Our culture has very strict rules about even and odd numbers of flowers. Gift bouquets must consist of an odd number of flowers. Even numbers are meant for grief or funerals. But in terms of etiquette, we count flowers only up to 10. If there are less than 10 flowers, then you should give an odd number of them as a gift. But if there are more than 10, then we don't count. 10, 11 or 12, the quantity doesn't really matter after that. There are, of course, old school people who count very accurately and carefully how many flowers they're given. As far as I know, this is not considered important in many European countries. In our culture, many resort to red roses. Men are never given red roses at all. Red roses are also excluded from official occasions and events. Red carnations have been very popular flowers in our country for many years. Some people now see the red carnation as a mourning flower due to the fact that it was quite cheap for some time and was commonly used in funeral processions. Therefore, it's best not to give middle-aged women this flower as a gift. But giving pink carnations to a young beautiful lady would be a great idea, especially when they're mini carnations and there's a lot of them on a stem. Дарья Геннадьевна, what does a birthday mean to a Russian person? How is it usually celebrated? Very differently. Some like birthdays, while others dislike them and don't even celebrate. People's attitude to it isn't clear, and it's very difficult to highlight any clear trends. Some people throw big birthday parties and celebrations in restaurants. That is a growing trend in celebrating birthdays, dining out. People have switched from intimate domestic celebrations to restaurants and cafes. Even those who can't afford a fancy restaurant due to a limited budget still go to cafes and celebrate their birthday there, but not home. It used to be the opposite. The birthday Day was an intimate family celebration to which only your nearest and dearest were invited, and which was celebrated in the comfort of your own home. If it was a lady's birthday, she cooked her signature dishes. The guests paid compliments and gave her gifts. Children's birthdays are unimaginable without a kids' entertainer, and lots of them. And there must be a huge birthday cake at the end. It's a little too much, and there are people who don't really like pompous birthday celebrations or don't want to celebrate. They do it in cafes, even in the daytime. They just have coffee with their friends, they make a reservation or each guest orders and then the one celebrating their birthday pays the bill. A little small talk, some friendly banter and then they go their separate ways. That's one of the ways birthdays are celebrated. The host or hostess is supposed to treat the guests to a big banquet. And what about paying the bill in a restaurant or cafe? 
If you've heard the sacred words, you're invited, and if you're going to a birthday party with a gift, then the person who invites you, the one whose birthday it is, or the host of the event, pays for it. If someone says, let's go celebrate, it's my birthday today, then it's quite possible you'll have to pay your own bill. You may have brought a gift, but you weren't invited to the celebration. It's simply an offering, and you could have not come. When someone says, let's go celebrate, you should clarify the celebration form and decide whether to go to it or not to go, based on the answer. Foreigners are very surprised to know that in our culture, the one having the birthday usually comes to school or work with treats for others. In Russian, to literally stand treat, but not vice versa. It is quite different in the West. On your birthday, you pay for nothing. Why is it so in our country? We have a tradition of hospitality. Our outlook is different. The logic goes that the guests are all invited at the behest of the one having the birthday. They wouldn't be there without them, as they're the reason for the occasion, so to speak. And since they decide when and in what form the celebration would take place, they will be the one to stand treat, because they will be the host. That's clear from the Russian expression, culprit of the yes, party. Yes, exactly. I bet that in your family you are the one responsible for bringing up children in terms of etiquette and manners. What do they think of etiquette and proper manners? Any negativity? My daughter is doing well in this regard. She likes it. She's seven and becoming a young lady. She, of course, sometimes fails due to her age. But children will be children, and she may not be completely a lady at some point. My son accepts these rules. I can see that he follows them in front of other people, but he may be rebellious when we are one-on-one. -on -one. And how old is your son? He's 12, a teenager. And what's your spouse's view on this? He often sighs dramatically. Why are there so many complications? We started our family before I started my career as an etiquette expert, and I honestly didn't introduce etiquette norms into my family from the very beginning. In fact, we followed vague cultural rules, but it's the strict rules and elements of high etiquette that I'm trying to gradually introduce to my family. I'd like everyone to follow the rules, but I also respect the individual freedoms of my children and my husband and leave it up to them. Thank you for listening to Understanding Russia. If you want to contact us, you can get in touch with us via our website at urpod.net, where you can find all our social media links, or via email, understandingrussia at gmail.com. We will be very happy to hear from you. You have been listening to Understanding Russia, a student-led podcast from Belgorod State University.